Amen. Amen, and welcome again. Welcome to everybody sitting here in the sanctuary. Welcome to everybody who will be watching us on TV and on YouTube. It is good to be one in the body of Christ, even when we are physically separated from one another. We give thanks for this Sunday, the sunshine, a great chance to worship God together. If you look in your bulletin, you see a few of our announcements. I want to begin the announcements by thanking Congregational Life. I don't know how many of you have noticed, the flowers each week have matched the flowers from our devotional, our Lenten devotional. So thank you to Congregational Life for making that very special. I hope you've been enjoying the Floriography Lenten devotional. If you didn't get one, we post it every day on Facebook, and it's also complete on the website. So if you'd like to go check out what you've been missing, it's been a really uplifting devotional. You see the choir schedule is listed, upcoming meetings. I would remind you if you would like to have an Easter lily in honor of or in memory of, please put some money in the envelope that is back by the offering plate on the back table and please write down your name and very clearly whether it is in memory of or in honor of and the name super clearly. It makes life in the office so much happier. Session met. Uh, they decided that it is time to sing, but not today. <laughs> Mona was looking very nervous for a minute. <laughs> Mona, surprise. No. <laughs> Next week, we will begin singing all three hymns again. We are very excited to add that back into worship. Also, they okayed fellowship to return in the basement. Congregational Life is working on plans and volunteers for that, and when it's all together, we'll let you know when our first Sunday of fellowship will be. So it's very exciting to consider all of these normal things that we, we have longed for this last time that are coming back. St. Paul's let us know that they are having an Easter egg hunt if we would like to join in. Uh, there is an RSVP date of March 28th. You can call the church over there. And again, for the food pantry, we are looking for all sizes of diapers this month, baby wipes, and canned fruit and vegetables. So the place to put that is at my left side of the back, there's a big can with these items lifted, listed, and we really appreciate everyone who gives there. Are there any other announcements that I have forgotten or neglected or left over? All right, well then let us continue in worship together.
Good morning. Please join us in the opening prayer. God of love. God's love has been poured into our hearts through the gift of the Holy Spirit. The proof of God's amazing love is this. While we were sinners, Christ died for us. Because we have faith in him, we dare to approach God in confidence. Confident in God's grace, let us confess our sin before God and one another. O holy God, we come in confession of our lack of love. We have neither loved ourselves nor our neighbors. We have passed by suffering and misfortune because of fear or busyness or preoccupation. We have held prejudices against people as deep as those against the Samaritans. Heal our pains, amend our faults, and guide us in ways of danger and compassion. For we pray in the name of Jesus, our most beloved neighbor, who cared for us even to the cross. Amen. Children of the Most High, you are forgiven and brought into the kingdom. Be filled with spiritual wisdom. Lead lives worthy of your inheritance. Bear fruit in all you say and do and think. God has rescued us and redeemed us from our sins, setting aside judgment to shower us with mercy. We will go and do likewise. Thanks be to God. Amen. They look like they are feverishly working back there, so... Keep going? <laughs> Keep going, okay. <laughs> the boys love that they're instructing me right now, I bet. <laughs> well, we will move right into our sermon warm-up. It is a time when we begin to focus our hearts and minds on the word of God that we will hear by thinking through a couple of questions. So my first question for you today is, what do you do when plants won't grow? What do we do if you have plants, indoor or outdoor? Yes. Water them, yes. Kim. Change the sunlight that they're in. Mm -hmm. 
Mickey gets the 911 call. <laughs> They're not growing. Be soon. Miracle Grow, yes, fertilizer. Oh, special light, purple plant light. I want one of those. <laughs> Partial effectiveness, huh? How about one more? One more thing we do. Throw them out. Sometimes we do. Sometimes it's just, just too much. Give them love. Thank you. That's a much better segue into my next question. Which is, what do we do when people aren't growing as we hope? If you have a friend or a family member or a neighbor that isn't growing as one would hope, what can we do? Try to help them. Pray a lot. Give them more love. Send them a card. Miracle grow. A casserole. A casserole, yes. Yes. Do not throw them out. Do not. That's right. Do not throw them out, right? We don't ever give up on people. Yep. And neither does God, which is the good news of our gospel today. That God never ever throws us out, even if we're not growing quite as God would hope. So we continue to think about how we help plants grow, how we help people grow, as we watch our next video. I got a this. Okay, let's listen to our scripture reading today. Okay, so we'll just move on, and it'll be okay. We'll just keep going. Thank you. The gospel today comes from the gospel of Luke, chapter 13, verses 1 through 9. At that very time, there were some present who told him about the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. He asked them, do you think that because these Galileans suffered in this way, they were worse sinners than all other Galileans? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish as they did. Or those, or those 18 who were killed when the Tower of Solemn fell on them, do you think that they were worse offenders than all the others living in Jerusalem? No, I tell you, but unless you repent, you will all perish just as they did. Then he told this parable. A man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came looking for fruit on it and found none. So he said to the gardener, See here, for three years I have come looking for fruit on this fig tree, and still I find none. Cut it down. Why should it be wasting the soil? He replied, Sir, let it alone for one more year until I dig round it and put manure on it. If it bears fruit next year, well and good. But if not, you can cut it down. Here ends the reading. Well, I used to think that the sensitive plant was the most magical of all God's creation. How many of you know what a sensitive plant is? The first place I met one was in my grandpa's basement, and he showed me how if you touch the teeny tiny leaves along the stem, they fold together and they would stay that way until my head was turned they would relax and I would paw over them all over again. It mystified me how this little plant could move so gracefully. The sensitive plant became even more wonderful in my book, 
than the Venus flytrap, who ate bugs for a living. So that was a pretty high placement. So you can imagine my delight when one day I found a pack of sensitive plant seeds at the store. I was ecstatic. I got out my jiffy pots and planted bunches of the seeds right away. Of course, not all of them sprouted, and some choked each other out, and some didn't care for their window ledge home. And finally, I was left with two plants, and that was okay, because I was just really happy to have those plants in my home. Even as an adult, whenever I walked in the room, I couldn't help but brush past it and watch it lift its leaves together, almost as if in prayer. It even bloomed these little purple puffy blooms. It was just wonderful. It was a delight to watch it do what it was created to do. Then one day, the plant started getting brown spots and withering. So I pruned off the dead branches and I tried watering less and then I tried watering more. And I moved it from window to table to window, and still it kept withering away. But the funny part was, as some branches were withering, at the same time, other parts were sending off new growth. I've never seen anything like it, the dying and the living on the same plant. And to tell you the truth, it annoyed me. The pile of dead leaves on the carpet, with new vines shooting off at the top, it frustrated me to no end. Despite my best efforts, the plants could not decide if they wanted to live or die. And so one day I got so frustrated, I plucked those plants out of the dirt and I threw them in the trash and I said, there, I will decide for you. As I opened the Bible this week, to begin preparation for the sermon, the story of my sensitive plants flooded back to me as we read of the unproductive fig tree, the impatient landowner, and the compassionate gardener. In the verses before our reading begins this morning, Jesus has been speaking to his disciples about the judgment of the coming days. And then someone runs in with some very bad news, and that is where our reading picks up. The news is about Galileans killed by Pilate as they were offering their sacrifices at the temple. Their blood mingled with the blood of the animals that they were sacrificing. And so the disciples, in an effort to make sense of this horrible news, ask, is this massacre? a sign of God's judgment? Now we know from biblical historians that Pontius Pilate could be an effective and brutal enforcer of Roman, Roman law against the occupied Jews. Luke does not tell us why Pilate murdered these Galileans, but killings of this sort were unfortunately commonplace. It's the way that Pilate kept control of the Jews. An interesting historical note is that Pilate was eventually removed from his position shortly after he crucified Jesus because his cruelty and excessive use of power was too much even for the Romans. So Jesus is told of Pilate's horrible action and just as now when there is some horrible disaster, people are trying to figure out what happened and how to make sense of it. So they ask why, why did this happen? And they immediately try to come up with a reason, with a world view that makes sense of tragedy and which makes that tragedy appear less likely to happen to them. We too often ask, why? After events that make us uncomfortable, or scared, confused, or angry, or grief-stricken. It's a natural human reaction. It's how we try to maintain a sense of order in our world and 
order in our personal sphere. Jesus, did you hear about what happened to those poor Galileans? And in the back of our head, we have a question. I wonder what they did to deserve that fate. They must have been terrible sinners. But this morning, Jesus is not drawn into that discussion. In fact, he throws the whole topic of sin back in the disciples' laps. He asks, so then what is it that you consider to be the reason for the 18 people who died in a terrible accident of a wall falling on them? Were they terrible sinners too? Jesus makes very clear that there is no necessary causality between misfortune and sin. And although it might seem comforting at a certain level to try and figure out why people deserve what is happening to them, or at least to figure out why what's happening is a natural response to a given set of circumstances, Jesus replies with an emphatic no. Not only were those killed in the accident and by Pilate not worse sinners than everyone else, he reminds the disciples, we're all sinners. And so if you hold that worldview, we are all susceptible to the bad things of this world. I tell you, unless you repent, you shall also be under judgment, Jesus says. His words are harsh, but the parable that follows is instructive and comforting. There is a fig tree, a tree that was made to produce what? Figs, that's right. But it hasn't done that. And since land was such a valuable commodity in that time, the landowner says, cut it down. If it's not going to make figs, we will, produce, uh, we will plant something that will. But the gardener, the gardener who must have grown fond of the plant while caring for it, says, let's give it one more year, one more season of chance, and then we'll see what happens. One more chance. And you know what's so frustrating about this parable is we never find out what happens to the tree. The next year, are there figs or is there a plum tree in its place? In his parables, Jesus often draws on imagery from nature and from agriculture, worlds with which his listeners would have been very familiar. If you turn to your bulletin cover, or maybe to the screen, we see another example of nature teaching us about the world and how we fit into it. Van Gogh was an avid admirer of Japanese art, and in particular of the ways that Japanese artists depicted nature. If we study Japanese art, he wrote, we see a human being who is undoubtedly wise and philosophic and intelligent, who spends his time doing what? In studying the distance between the Earth and the moon? No. In studying Bismarck's policy? No. He studies a single blade of grass. For Vincent, the best Japanese artist live in nature as though they themselves were flowers. We remember perhaps from two weeks ago that one of Van Gogh's life goals was to go into nature always, to be a part of nature and surrounded by it. When he moved from Paris to Arles in the south of France, he declared, here, my life will become more and more like a Japanese painter's, living close to nature. In Almond Blossom, we encounter not only the fruitfulness of nature, 
but also Vincent's desire to learn from his Japanese counterparts. It's his efforts to bear fruit as an artist himself. Here we see him working very hard to bear the fruit that he was created to produce. And to do this, he knew he needed to learn from others, to lean into others, and to be taught by others. For Van Gogh, painting wasn't just a way of recording or depicting nature. It was a way of living in nature, both for the artist and the viewer. This was a part of his life's purpose as well. So learning from the, al the almond blossom and the fig tree, the question comes to us, what fruit do we hope to bear in our lives this week, or this year, or this season of life? And what fertilizer, what nourishment, what teaching do we need? And of course, how can we also offer that to others? When I was in seminary, we were asked to uh, tell our call stories all the time. It seemed like every year, every class began with this question about how did you get here? And I remember at the beginning of every year, every class, my call story seemed so unremarkable next to everybody else's. There were several men and women who had been very successful in the business world, but they couldn't get over that nagging feeling that there was something more in life for them. They couldn't ignore the ministers and church friends who repeatedly told them that they saw the gifts for ordained ministry in them, and so they downsized their salaries and their lifestyles and sometimes even their families in the process. And they headed back to seminary in their middle years. There was a woman who had grown up without the church, who had married and had a family without the church. And then one day her son, who had severe hearing loss and had been going to church with a friend, asked her to come to a healing service with him that evening. And she did. And her son left that service hearing. She said that she got to know God in a big, way that day, and that led her straight to seminary. And there was the woman who was 59 when she entered seminary. She had put off her nagging sense of call to finish school and to raise a family, and finally at 59 she could put off the three years of school no longer, even though her denomination had a mandatory retirement for pastors at 65. In these stories, in all of those that I heard, people had a sense that they were not producing the fruit that God called them to produce. Some were producing exquisite, expensive apples, but they couldn't get over the feeling that they were supposed to be generating oranges. Some lamented that their branches were barren and no amount of fertilizer that the world spread around them could make them blossom as the great gardener had ordained. We all know what it feels like, deep in our souls, to have that nagging realization that you are not creating the crop that you are called to. Perhaps you are dissatisfied at work angry or listless or bored. Your passion does not lie in the same place as your paycheck and it is literally ripping you apart. Or perhaps you are disturbed by the workings of the world around you. Stories of hungry children make your belly ache. Or stories of toxic waste spilled or strewn about makes your skin crawl. Maybe you look at the relationships in your life and you see more closed doors than open ones. 
more barren places than places of growth. These calls, these naggings, they are deep realizations that wind up being God's mirror to us that our foliage is not quite what it should be. And if we are not following our passion down the path that God has created for us, we are barren. We must continue to ask, are we letting the Lord fertilize our hearts and our minds and our imaginations so that we are producing good fruit? Now, I will never, ever know what would have happened to my sensitive plant if I had let it live. Would it have blossomed? Would it have died? I'll never know. I'll never know what someone whose time on earth is done would have done with one more year or one more day. But I do know this. This is the season to begin to concentrate on our own growth. This is the season to get ourselves ready to produce whatever it is God is calling you to produce. If you knew that the great gardener had given you one year to live, what would you do with that time? The truth is, none of us knows what the future has in store for us. And so today, my prayer is that when the landowner comes to check on us, we will all be producing faithful fruit. Amen. As we enter into our pastoral prayer, Today that prayer is responsive, and it is found on the back of your bulletin. So I invite you to take a deep breath, to focus on God, and to join me in this responsive prayer. Draw me today into fresh encounters with Jesus, O God. And as I pass through whatever the day's valleys, keep my head lifted up to the mountain from whence my help comes. Never let me forget the people that Jesus welcomed. The bad and the good. Hear us as we continue in prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let us stand and sing our hymn number 261.
as we go forth to proclaim and live the good news. Wherever we are, may we know your treasured love in our hearts and be always ready to open a door as soon as we hear Jesus coming and knocking. And may the grace of God, the love of our Lord Jesus Christ, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you now and always. Amen. Please be seated. <clears throat>